Hi everyone, today a video on NMR spectroscopy looking at proton NMR. So in proton NMR we're looking at the spin active hydrogen nucleus 1H and that's what we're investigating. Now in the previous video of this series we talked uh, about carbon-13 NMR and we talked more generally about the theory of NMR and how if we have odd numbered uh, mass numbers such as 1H carbon-13, nitrogen-15, fluorine-19 that these were spin active nuclei and we talked about this kind of analogy of a, a bar magnet. Now 1H normal hydrogen is a hundred percent abundant and so recording a spectrum is much more uh, much much easier than doing carbon-13 NMR that we talked about in the previous video. We said that only 1% of carbon is actually carbon-13 uh, and so because now uh, hydrogen is 100% abundant it's much easier to record the spectrum, we can do it more quickly, we can do it with less material. But like in carbon-13 NMR, the hydrogen atoms that are attached to different functional groups or in different environments are going to feel the magnetic field, the external magnetic field, differently. And we said that electrons shield nuclei from the external magnetic field. You have an induced magnetic field due to the electron circulating, which goes in the opposite direction to the external magnetic field. And so therefore, electrons shield the nuclei from the external magnetic field, and therefore it feels slightly less than the total value of that magnetic field. So the greater the electron density around a hydrogen atom, the more shielded it is. The more electrons we have, the more of these induced magnetic fields going in the other direction, and hence it feels less of that external magnetic field. Therefore, it has a lower resonance frequency, and the resonance frequency was essentially that frequency of, uh, that relates to an energy between the parallel and the anti-parallel states for the spins. And if we have a lower resonance frequency, we have a lower chemical shift value. If hydrogen is directly bound to an electronegative atom, or it's bound to a carbon, which is itself bound to an electronegative atom, this both removes electron density and deshields the hydrogen atom. And so if we deshield our hydrogen atom, it therefore feels more of the external electric field, it resonates at a higher frequency and hence a higher chemical shift. So it can be a hydrogen that's directly bound to an electronegative element, for example, by the uh, binding it straight to a hydrogen or an oxygen in an alcohol, for example, or an amine. It could also be uh, if it's attached to a carbon that is itself attached to an electronegative atom. So we have examples here, for example, uh, of an, for example, an aldehyde uh, resonating at quite a high frequency. Now, the further that these H atoms get from an electronegative atom, the lower the chemical shift is. This become more and more shielded. So this electronegative effect can quite often work up to a couple of uh, sort of bonds apart, but for the further away that we go, the less this electronegative effect of the electronegative atom pulling the electrons towards itself and away from the carbon or the hydrogen, uh, the less that is actually felt. Now, hydrogen environments are more difficult to distinguish than carbon environments. For example, methane may appear to have four different hydrogen environments. CH4 is methane, so it may appear that we have four different hydrogens there. In fact, those are all equivalent by symmetry. And we talked in the previous video with the carbon-13 NMR that one of the best ways to see how many environments we had was to look for any symmetry in the molecule. And if we had, for example, a mirror plane halfway through the molecule down the middle of it, that the stuff on either side would be in, in, in the same environments. And so methane may appear to have four, but through symmetry, actually all of those hydrogens are equivalent by symmetry, and therefore it only has one hydrogen environment. If we take methanol, there are two different hydrogen environments. Now, methanol is CH3OH, so the hydrogen on our oxygen is clearly in a different environment to the CH3 group. Now again, it may appear that the three hydrogens on the CH3 group, again, are all different, but actually, again, they're all the same. And this is because CH single bonds have free rotation. They're able to rotate free. And what this makes them is all equivalent by symmetry. Again, it's all to do with the symmetry. Now, the area under each peak is something called the integration trace. And this represents the ratio of hydrogen atoms that produce it. So if we have a three to one ratio from our integration, tra integration trace, the key thing here is the word ratio. It doesn't mean the actual number. It could be, but it could also be a much higher ratio. So if we have our ratio of three to one, that could mean that we have three hydrogens in environment one and one hydrogen in environment two, 
Or, for example, we could have nine hydrogens in environment one, three hydrogens in environment two, and so on. So the integration choice doesn't necessarily mean the actual number of atoms that are involved in those, it's the ratio of hydrogen atoms that are producing it. But as you can see, essentially all the theory for how this works is exactly the same as carbon, 13 NMR. It's just now that we're dealing with, uh, uh, with protons, essentially, with hydrogen atoms. And again, you'll be given a table like I've shown on the right here with different functional groups, different environments for these hydrogens to be in and where their approximate chemical shifts come. So an actual example we talked on the previous slide about methanol, about how there are two different environments. We have our OH hydrogen, which I've circled in red. That's clearly in a different environment to our CH3 group. And while these three hydrogens may appear to be in different environments, actually due to symmetry, because we have free rotation around these CH bonds, um, they are actually all in the same environment. So we should expect to see two peaks in our NMR spectrum. We have three hydrogens in the CH3 group. We have one hydrogen in the, uh, on the OH group, and therefore our integration trace should show a three to one ratio. The final thing is to think about which one's going to be more de-shielded than the other. Our CH3 uh, group, while those hydrogens are, uh, are bonded uh, to a carbon that's bonded to an oxygen atom, the hydrogen that's in the OH group is itself directly bonded to an oxygen. So because that hydrogen is actually closer to that oxygen, we'd expect the OH group to come much higher up than the CH3 groups. But the CH3 groups, the hydrogens for that CH3 group themselves will be a fairly high shift uh, because they are on a carbon atom that is attached to an oxygen as well. And so if we look at our, our um, NMR here again, remember our x-axis is chemical shift, but note that it goes from right to left in terms of, of increasing here. Um, and we have our energy absorbed going up the, the y-axis as well. Again, our chemical shift, remember, given the symbol of that delta, and it's measured in ppm, parts per million. And you can see that we have this, this very big peak here, about 3 ppm, with an integration trace of 3. That must be our CH3 group. Uh, and then we have our um, the peak for, for one hydrogen, about 4 ppm. That must be our OH group. You'll also see that there's TMS. Remember from the previous video that TMS is our reference compound, tetramethyl silane. We'll talk more about this in a few slides time. But then that's given the value of 0 ppm, and everything is measured relative to that. And again, as I said in the previous video, always draw out the full displayed formula for NMR problems to be able to see all the environments. It's very likely to make mistakes if you start drawing things out, even as structural formulae, but certainly if you just use the, the sort of compound formula, make sure you draw everything out as a full displayed formula to be able to see the environments and to be able to see if there's any symmetry in that molecule. So tetramethyl silane, TMS, we have just said here that they, they are um, TMS is our reference compound. So the chemical shift values are measured by comparing it to this reference standard. And so the standard that we use here for, for the hydrogen atom shift um, is in tetramethyl silane. So the formula SiCH3-4, so literally four methyl groups on a silicon, tetramethyl silane, TMS. And the structure of it I've just shown at the top there, it's actually a, a tetrahedral molecule. And the chemical shifts of these proton uh, protons in tetramethyl silane are zero by definition. Now, there's a number of reasons why TMS is used. The first is that all of those hydrogen atoms, all 12 of them, are in exactly the same environment. So again, due to the symmetry of the molecule and all the free rotations that we have, all of those hydrogen atoms, all 12 of them, are in exactly the same environment. They're also very shielded. They're bonded, so the carbon groups are bonded to an electropositive silicon atom. Silicon is more electropositive than the carbon and the, and the hydrogen. And so therefore they end up being having more electron density around them and typically quite shielded. And because there's a lot of them, there's 12 of them, what this gives rise to is a very sharp, intense single peak that is typically far away from lots of other signals in our NMR. And so typically that's really useful. It's very easy to see. It's sharp, it's intense, it's a single peak, and it's far away from other single, uh, single signals, so it's not going to interfere with anything else that we're trying to measure. The second is that it's inert, so it's not going to react with the, with the compounds that we're trying to measure, the NMR4. It's non-toxic, so it's safe, 
and it's fairly easy to remove from the sample. Once you need to use your NMR sample in further reactions, it's easy to be able to remove it from the sample. Now, NMR spectra are usually measured in solution. You can do solid state NMR, but typically they are measured in solution. Now, of course, as we said in the previous video, because hydrogen is NMR active, you don't want the solvent to contain any hydrogen atoms. This would then interfere with the hydrogen atoms in the actual compound you're trying to measure, potentially massively override them, and so you wouldn't see any signals for your compound, you'd just see the solvent peaks. Um, and so it would start to give uh, real problems in your NMR. So typically we end up using solvents here that have no hydrogens attached. So a common solvent might be carbon tetrachloride, although that's being phased out more and more now due to it being very, very toxic. And so the most common now is, is uh, a deuterated form of lots of common solvents. The most common one is CdCl3, so that's deuterated chloroform. Those are the ones that's deuterated benzene, C6D6, or even deuterated water, D2O. And really it just depends on what your sample is actually soluble in for what you would use. Now, deuterium is spin active, and we saw in the carbon-13 NMR that we typically got a triplet at uh, three lines of equal intensity at 77 ppm. That was because if we use CdCl3 in our carbon NMR, we see the deuterium at 77 ppm that produces those three lines of equal intensity. Now, deuterium is spin active, but it doesn't produce a signal in the same range as hydrogen, so we typically don't see uh, the deuterium being shown in our spectrum. Now, sometimes you can also use these solvents actually as reference points, so it's quite common now as well to actually not even include any tetramethyl silane in your sample, but to just simply uh, reference where the solvent peak will come. Because even uh, a common solvent like CdCl3, a deuterated solvent, will still have a very, very tiny percentage of residual protons in there, residual, the, the CHCl3. There'll be a very, very tiny amount of that still in there, and so that will produce a peak in your NMR. However, it won't be so massive that you, you know, overrides everything out like using just a normal um, hydrogen solvent. And so typically CdCl3, the peak for the, the, uh, the residual proton in that for CHCl3 actually comes at 7.26 ppm. And so quite often it's very, uh, very often done now that you reference it to that peak at 7.26 ppm rather than the zero for TMS. But the key thing for solvents is that we can't have any hydrogens in there. So CCl4, CdCl3, C6D6, D2O, anything without any hydrogens in there. And TMS is, uh, has these 12 protons all in the same environment, very sharp, uh, intense single peak away from other signals. And it's in a non-toxic and easy to remove. Now, proton MR spectrum actually become a little bit more complicated than um, carbon-13 NMR spectrum. And this is because rather than in the carbon NMR spectrum, we simply had single lines. And in the proton NMR we've just shown for, for methanol, we drew it as single lines. But actually, if you took the NMR spectrum, the, the proton NMR spectrum of methanol, it wouldn't be single lines. The individual peaks actually possess a fine structure. So they are split into patterns of lines, and this is called spin-spin splitting. Now, the reason this occurs is because if we have uh, hydrogen atoms being in different environments, the magnetic fields can actually start to couple to each other. They can interact with each other. So we have the magnetic fields on each of the hydrogen atoms, and these now, if they're in different environments, start to interact together. The key thing is as long as they are close enough. So typically, it's up to three bonds away. If you count one, two, three bonds, and, and they're still within that three bond number, then they will often... Uh, interact with each other, and this causes the lines to get split into multiple lines, a pattern of lines. Now, this may look to complicate the spectrum, but actually it's a really incredibly useful tool for structure determination. And so the splitting that we, um, that we get can actually be predicted using something called the N plus 1 rule. Now, the N here stands for the number of hydrogens that is on an adjacent carbon atom. So it's not, the, not on the carbon atom that the hydrogen that we're dealing with is attached to, but the one that is on adjacent to it, next to it. And we'll see lots of examples of this in, in the next few slides. If it still doesn't make sense, so don't worry. But essentially, we can use this rule to say, well, if there's no hydrogens on the adjacent carbon, N plus 1 gives us 1, and therefore we have a single line, and we call this a singlet. 
This is exactly the same as we would see in the, the, for the, the peaks that we get in carbon-13 NMR, just single lines. If there is one hydrogen on the adjacent carbon, well, n plus 1 then gives us 2. And so we see two lines of equal intensity. This is what we call a doublet. You can see an example of this over here on the right. A one-to-one -one ratio and two lines, we call it a doublet. If there are two hydrogens on the adjacent carbon, n plus 1 gives us 3. And so we end up seeing three lines of 1 to 2 to 1 intensity called a triplet. And if there are three hydrogens on the adjacent carbon, then we end up with four lines of 1 to 3 to 3 to 1 intensity. And this is called a quartet. So the overall main peak, which we can think of as being essentially a single line, will get split into a pattern of n plus 1 smaller peaks, where n is the number of hydrogen atoms on an adjacent carbon. Now, you might be wondering why we don't see this spin-spin this splitting or coupling for carbon-13 NMR spectrum. And the reason we don't see it is due to the low abundance of carbon-13. So if I have, for example, let's say that my, my peak that I'm going to see in my proton NMR is a doublet. It will have started out in life as a single line. And then due to the spin-spin the, the splitting, the coupling of these two magnetic fields, essentially, it gets split into two lines of equal intensity. So each of those lines in our doublet is now 50% of what the original line was. If we have our, uh, our triplet, a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio, we start off with one line, gets split into our triplet, and so we would have 25%, 50%, 25% of that original line uh, length, essentially. And so the more lines that we split this up into, um, essentially the smaller these multiplets look, on the NMR spectrum because in fact it's put one line into lots of smaller lines. Remember that for, for proto-NMR we said that 1H nucleus is 100% abundant. For carbon-13 only 1% of carbon is carbon-13. So we're dealing with a really really low abundance of it anyway. Imagine now splitting that into lots and lots of lines. A 1% peak being split into lots and lots of lines. Quite often you can't see that splitting below what we call the, the baseline noise level, essentially. You can't end up seeing it, it essentially becomes invisible. So typically what happens are we, um, we record these carbon NMR spectra as proton decoupled. So essentially we, we set something on the machine where we ignore this coupling to the hydrogens. And we don't see any coupling to inequivalent carbons again, but again because of the low intensity. Because it's only 1% abundant for carbon-13, we don't see that coupling to other carbons. So carbon-13 spectra are always just single lines. For proto-NMR spectra, you can get single lines if you have a singlet where we have no hydrogens on the adjacent carbon. But more often than not, we end up seeing these what we call multiplets, these, these um, peak patterns essentially, whether we see a doublet, a triplet, a quartet, for example. Another important thing to note is that we talked about the integration trace for hydrogen NMR we didn't talk about an integration trace for carbon-13 NMR, and the reason is we can't integrate carbon-13 spectra. Now, the reasons for this are way beyond A-level. It's to do with the fact that when you decouple the hydrogens from the, the, from the spectra, so you do a proton decoupled spectrum, because we're only dealing with 1% of carbon, we don't want it to be split into lots and lots of lines. We decouple the protons from it, so we just see the carbons. Um, and when we do this hydrogen decoupling process, well, that affects how the, the relaxation times of these nuclei uh, work. If you go back to the first video, we talked about the fact that what we record here is the, uh, the relaxation. We've flipped our spin from parallel to anti-parallel, and our, our computer, our detector, our radio frequency detector, records um, the electromagnetic energy that is emitted when we have it relaxing from the anti-parallel back down to the parallel state. Now, that time it takes for it to relax gets all, all sort of messed up by the fact that we do this hydrogen decoupling, um, it's actually this relaxation time that allows us to be able to integrate the spectrum. But as I said, that's all kind of beyond a level standard. The really key thing to try and do is to do not try and integrate a carbon-13 spectrum. For proton and R spectrum, yes, we can do the integration. Remember, it's the ratio of the atoms that produce that peak. For carbon-13 NMR, we don't see coupling and we do not try and integrate it. So let's now look at some examples. The first one here I have is ethanol, so CH3CH2OH. Now there are three different hydrogen environments in this molecule. 
Again, we can think about symmetry. Is there any symmetry in this molecule? Well, no, there isn't. There isn't any kind of mirror planes that we can draw through the middle of the molecule or anything like that to, to show either side of it being the same. And so each of these sort of hydrogen environments is different. Clearly, we have our OH hydrogen environment, which is very different to the carbon based hydrogen environments. But then actually that CH2 section and the CH3 section, they are both in different environments too. But again, remember, due to the free rotation of these CH bonds, that actually the two hydrogens on that middle carbon there are in the same environment. The three hydrogens on the end carbon are in the same environment as each other, but the CH2 and the CH3 groups are different environments. It quite often sort of matches up with if they were different carbon environments as well as different hydrogen environments. We can then start to think about where these are going to come on our spectrum. Clearly we have our, our hydrogen for the OH group being uh, directly bound to an electronegative oxygen atom. That's going to deshield our hydrogen nucleus. It's going to feel a greater magnetic field strength. Therefore, it will resonate at a higher frequency and therefore have a higher chemical shift. And so that's the one we'd expect to be the most deshielded, the furthest left, the highest numbers on our spectrum. We then have our middle CH2 group. Now, this is closer to the oxygen than the CH3 group at the end is. And so while our hydrogen is not directly bound, our hydrogen in the CH2 group is bound to a carbon that is bound to an electronegative oxygen. And so that one there would be the CH2 group would expect it to be um, more deshielded than the CH3 group. And that's exactly what we see. We have our OH there at roughly sort of 4.8 ppm. That there is a singlet, as we'd expect. Our hydrogen isn't attached to any, any carbons next door or anything like that. Therefore, the N plus 1 rule is zero. Uh, the N is zero, sorry, so the N plus 1 therefore comes out as 1, and therefore it's a singlet. Our CH2 group, to the left of it, we have an oxygen, so we don't need to worry about that. On the right of it, how many hydrogens are attached to our adjacent carbon, remember, was what the N stood for. So if we look at the CH2 group, the adjacent carbon is the CH3 group. There are three hydrogens on that, so N is 3. So 3 plus 1 from N plus 1 is 4. And therefore, we would expect to see a quartet, 1 to 3 to, th uh, one to, three to 3 to 1 ratio of lights. And that's what we see there at about 3.5 ppm. If we have one of these multiplets, like a doublet, a triplet, a quartet, the chemical shift value that we report is for the, exactly in the middle of whatever multiplet it is, in the middle of the triplet, the middle of the quartet, whatever it is, find the middle of it, and that's the chemical shift. And then finally, our CH3 group, we expect that to be the most shielded, it's the furthest away from any electronegative atoms. That's what we find, it's just after 1 ppm. Uh, and then we look at our n plus 1 rule, remember n is the number of hydrogens on an adjacent carbon, so the carbon next to that CH3 group is the CH2 group. There are two hydrogens on that carbon. So if you N plus one, that gives us three. And so we end up with a triplet of one to two to one intensity. Now here, the integration trace here isn't actually shown, but you can sort of see that the CH3 peak is bigger than the CH2 peak. And while actually the CH2 peak doesn't look bigger than the OH peak, remember that the CH2 peak would have started as a single line and has now been split into four and so you can imagine that that peak actually would have been bigger than the OH peak. And so the integration ratio here isn't actually explicitly shown, but just simply by the area under the, the peaks, actually how big, how tall these peaks are, we can sort of see that it corresponds to three versus two versus one hydrogens. Now, generally, OH and NH protons for, for alcohols and, and for sort of aiming groups are pretty unpredictable. It all depends on... Um, the solvent, temperature, the extent of hydrogen bonding. It's very, very variable. They're always singlets because we don't have a coupling to adjacent hydrogens. Essentially, the oxygen kind of gets in the way. It stops the coupling from occurring. It's so um, essentially, we have lots of electrons in, in p orbitals in, in the oxygen. We have lone pairs that essentially stop the hydrogens from communicating with anything further than the oxygen. Um, and the chemical shifts can really very dr dramatically vary. If you go back to your table at the start, you'll see that an alcohol kind of went from sort of all the way down from kind of one all the way up to sort of five ppm. It's a really wide range that you can see it in. We've talked about the splitting. The CH3 group has a higher intensity due to three hydrogens versus two hydrogens. And also because we're only splitting it into three lines and not into four lines. Each peak represents a non-identical hydrogen atom. And we talked about this idea in the carbon uh, 13 NMR video as well, that each of our peaks in our NMR represents a non 
equivalent or non-identical hydrogen atom, hydrogen atom, something that's in a different environment. But it doesn't necessarily mean that because we only see three peaks, that we only have three uh, sets of, of hydrogen environments, essentially. What we could see here, or three sets of, of three hydrogens, essentially. One peak could mean that we have more than one hydrogen atom because several hydrogen atoms could be in the same environment. And again, this is pretty more helpful uh, because we have our integration trace in hydrogen NMR, which we don't have in carbon-13 NMR. And so the key thing is that we have uh, these being non-identical hydrogen environments. But if we have symmetry in the molecule, it could be that we have a lot more hydrogens than we think because um, due to the symmetry, we have essentially maybe half the number of environments that we'd expect if we forgot that symmetry. Next one is this compound here, so C3H7BRO. I've drawn this out. This is an example of what we call an ether. So an ether is where we have a carbon, single bond to oxygen, single bond to another carbon. And then we also have a, a bromine substituent at the end of that chain. Now, if we look for our different hydrogen environments, again, we look to see really, first of all, is there any symmetry in this molecule? And no, there isn't. There's no kind of mirror plane down the middle of this molecule or anywhere in this molecule that we could make it look the same on both sides. And so therefore, we have three hydrogen environments, our CH3 group at the end, and then those two CH2 groups. Now, if we were looking at the spectrum and trying to assign this, we could start from our left and we'd go, OK, we have a CH3 group at the end, at the left. It's bound to an oxygen, so it's not directly bound to a carbon. There's no adjacent carbons. And so we don't have to worry about our N plus one rule. N here is zero. So we'd expect to see a singlet. This would be a very easy one to see. And you can see if you look at our spectra here, it goes from zero up to kind of nine ppm. Um, those black lines in the middle between three and four are our peaks. And typically what you have to do is expand it, kind of go between 3.8 and 3.3 as it's done here. Uh, and you can see the actual fine structure of these peaks now. But you can see at roughly about 3.4 ppm, there is quite a large singlet. So that would be for our CH3 group. We'd expect a singlet to use the M plus one rule. And um, we'd expect a fairly large peak because not only is it not being split, it's also for three hydrogens, the most hydrogens in any environment here. We then have our two uh, CH2 groups. Now, one of them is connected to an oxygen. One of them is connected to a bromine. Now, we would expect that the one on the left that's connected to the oxygen would be more de-shielded than the one on the right connected to the bromine, simply through electronegative inductive arguments, because the oxygen is more electronegative than the bromine is. So we'd expect that CH2 on the left to be more de-shielded than the CH2 on the right. And that's exactly what we expect. Uh, exactly what we see in our spectrum as well. If we have to think about the M plus one rule as well, if we take the left hand one or the right hand one, because they're both the same, the adjacent carbon has two hydrogens on, so M plus one gives us three. So both of these CH2 groups will come out as triplets, a one to two to one ratio. And we can see here that we have a triplet centered around 3.47 ppm. That would be the one uh, because that's lower down than the other triplet at a less chemical shift. That would be the one connected to the bromine. And then we have one at about 3.7 ppm, slightly more de-shielded, slightly higher up in terms of chemical shift. Uh, and that's the one that's connected to our oxygen. Again, note the splitting of these peaks. Also note the intensities. So the singlet is much, much higher than the, um, the two triplets are because we have three hydrogens versus two as well as the fact that we've been having to split our CH2 group peaks into three lines rather than the one line for the singlet. Now, using this knowledge of the M plus one rule and also really the electronegativity and, and, and the expected chemical shifts we'd expect to see, you should be able to predict NMR spectra for a given structure too. So not being, only being given an NMR spectrum and being asked to work out what the molecule is maybe, but actually sometimes being given the molecule and to predict what the NMR spectra would look like. So let's say we have this molecule, 2-hydroxy pentam 3 And I've drawn this out here in black. First of all, the first thing would always be to work out the number of environments. Now, again, if we look at this molecule, is there any symmetry in this molecule? No, there isn't. There's no mirror planes that we can draw. And so actually all of our hydrogens uh, here are in different environments. But again, it's like, the CH3 group, the CH2 group, 
The hydrogens in those respective environments are all equal. They're all in the same environment because of free rotation, but the actual hydrogen environments themselves are different. So we have five hydrogen environments. We have our CH3 group at the end going from the left. We then have this hydrogen that I've labelled two. We then have our CH2 group uh, after the carbonyl, labelled three. The CH3 group right at the end on the right, labelled four. And then the hydrogen um, on the OH group, which I've labelled five. So what I like to do is write out a table. So I write environment number, one, two, three, four, five. I then work out what the splitting of each of these uh, environments would be, would be. So we're going to use the n plus 1 rule. So environment 1 is a CH3 group at the end. The adjacent carbon has one hydrogen attached to it directly. Therefore through n plus 1 the splitting would be 2, a doublet. For environment 2, the adjacent carbon, going to the, going to the right it's the carbonyl group, so no, no hydrogens. Going to the left there are three hydrogens and therefore n plus 1 equals 4, so we'd expect to see a quartet. For the CH2 group labelled number 3, again the same idea, to the left it's a carbonyl group, no hydrogens, to the right it's a CH3 group, so three hydrogens on the adjacent carbon, um, n plus 1 therefore gives us 4, and so a quartet. Environment 4 is our CH3 group at the end on the right, the adjacent carbon has two hydrogens on it, so n plus 1 gives us 3, a triplet, and then finally, for number five, we again, we have this OH group here, our oxygen's in the way. It doesn't couple to the hydrogen uh, on the carbon that we're attached to. And so we see a singlet, just what n plus one comes out to be one, because n is zero. Then I start to write down a kind of approximate, uh, approximate chemical shift. This can be done using the, the table that you'll be given in the exam. So if we look at uh, environment number one, we have a CH3 group that's bonded to a carbon that's bonded to an OH group. So there's an electronegative atom a few bonds away. It's not so particularly close, um, but it would be maybe slightly de-shielded compared to just a, a sort of alkane CH3 group. And so I'm going to say roughly around 1, 1.2 ppm. Environment number two is a hydrogen that's connected to the carbon that is directly attached to that OH group. So that's going to be much, much more de-shielded and therefore up here approximately around 4 ppm. The CH2 group we've labelled three. Uh, it's next to a carbonyl group, so it's, the hydrogens are on a carbon that is itself attached to a carbon, attached to an electronegative atom. So again, we have this kind of small distance factor. It's not so close to the electronegative oxygen, but it is sort of fairly close, a few bonds away. And so I'm going to guess here for about 2.5 ppm using the, the table that you get in the exam. Go back a few slides if you need to go back and check. Environment 4, the CH3 group. Well, now this one, again, it's a CH3 group. It's now... Uh, really three bonds away from the electronegative oxygen. Compare it to the CH3 group on the left, number one, that was only two bonds away from uh, electronegative oxygen. And so it's again likely to be maybe slightly de-shielded compared to just a normal alkane CH3, but really not by very much. A lower chemical shift than the other CH3 group as well, so I'm going to say roughly about 0.8. And then uh, number five was our OH group. Again, we've said these are very, very unpredictable. I'm going to guess a ppm of around 3. And then my final column is just useful for the integration trace. I'm just going to write down how many hydrogens are in each of those environments. So it's 3, 1, 2, 3, 1. So we can then go about sketching this NMR spectrum. So I'm going to draw. Here I've not even put a y-axis. Typically you don't really need to put a y-axis down for the intensity, the energy intensity. But we always have to put our x-axis down for our, our ppm, our chemical shift, symbol delta, measured in ppm. And I simply just put these in. So my first environment, number one, uh, was my CH3 group. I said that'd be roughly about 1.2 ppm, so roughly 1.2. I'm going to put a doublet, and I'm going to put it as quite a large peak. We have three hydrogens, so the big, one of the bigger numbers here in terms of how many hydrogens, and also it's only being split into two lines. And so the way to draw it is to draw your blue, the blue lines I've drawn here, and then just to write above this kind of integration of three. Environment number two was the hydrogen that was attached to that carbon to the OH group. That we said would be a quartet at roughly four, so I'm going to draw my quartet. Now, notice how small the quartet peak is at around four ppm. Not only have we split our line into four lines, but also it's only for one hydrogen. So it's a very, very small peak. We have our integration of one hydrogen, 
And remember, for a quartet, the ratio of the lines is 1 to 3 to 3 to 1. Then environment number 3, we said would be a quartet at around 2.5 ppm. So again, draw that in. Notice how it's a slightly bigger peak here. Again, we've split our line into 4 to make it a quartet. But we now have an integration ratio of 2 as opposed to 1. So it's a slightly bigger peak. Environment 4 is uh, the CH3 group on the end. We said that would be about 0.8 ppm and a triplet. So again here, uh, I have a fairly big peak because I have three, um, three hydrogens, but notice how it's less than the three hydrogens in the doublet in terms of the height because we've had to split our lines here into three for a triplet rather than two for a doublet. And remember from our ratios that a doublet is a one-to-one -one line ratio, a triplet is a one-to-two-to-one -to -one line ratio. And then finally, our singlet for the OH group, we said was very unpredictable. Typically, these OH and NH ones, because they depend on hydrogen bonding, they depend on temperature, the solvents, they tend to also be very, very broad peaks as well, rather than the kind of sharp lines that we see elsewhere. And so I've put kind of quite a broad peak there over 3 ppm uh, with an integration ratio of 1. Again, very small because there's only one hydrogen. Now, the, if you're wondering where these um, ratio of intensities for the lines come from, for example, 1 to 3 to 3 to 1 in a quartet or 1 to 2 to 1 in a triplet, it actually comes from something called Pascal's triangle. So you can look that up if you're interested. Another thing just to bring up as well is that we talked about in the carbon-13 NMR that when we the, the peak that we saw for our CDCl3 due to the deuterium there was a 1 to 1 to 1 triplet. It's a triplet with three equal intensity lines. Here in proton NMR, we see triplets in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. Now, the only difference is because in proton NMR, we are dealing with a proton. In carbon-13 NMR, we're seeing the CDCl3. We're actually seeing the deuterium. This has a higher spin than a proton does, than hydrogen does, and therefore it actually means that it ends up being a 1 to 1 to 1 rather than a 1 to 2 to 1. But it's really nothing to concern yourselves with. The key thing to remember is that for proton NMR, when we get these splitting of lines, that a quartet is 1 to 3 to 3 to 1, a doublet is 1 to 1, and a triplet is 1 to 2 to 1. And these come from Pascal's triangle. And if we then look at a, a spectrum of this, we can actually see that we were pretty spot on. We have our quartet just past 4 ppm. We have another quartet at about 2.5 ppm. We have our doublet uh, at about 1.4 ppm and then a triplet at 1 ppm. So we were pretty fairly close to this. We had the right splittings, we had roughly the right chemical shift. So if you ever have to do this, they're never going to mark you on do you get exactly the right chemical shift. As long as it's roughly in the right place, that's right. Key thing is that we've got the intensities of these peaks right, with the smaller ones being smaller, the bigger ones being bigger, like we got in our predicted spectrum. And we got the splitting right as well. So, time to have a go at some questions to do with Proton NMR. Um, if you'd like to have a go, pause the video and the answers will be on the next slide. So, I'm actually going to start off by using the um, questions that are in the red box on the right. So, this was the um, compound J being studied by Proton NMR spectroscopy. And so, we had here to identify a solvent in which J could be dissolved in before obtaining its 1H uh, NMR spectrum. So you could put a number of different things here. The key thing is that you don't want to have any hydrogens involved in it. We also maybe have some slight polarity in here because we have some chlorines involved in compound J. And so a good one would be to use deuterated chloroform, CdCl3. Could have also put CCl4 as well, maybe. We then have the number of peaks in the proton MR spectrum. So again, here we need, now need to look for um, symmetry in our molecule. Now, the only bit of symmetry really that we can see here are the two CH3 groups that are on that kind of middle carbon. The quaternary carbon um, has two CH3 groups on there. Those are actually in the same environment. Essentially, they're sort of both above and below. They are the same. Um, they're in the same hydrogen environment. However, everything else is in different environments. So we have our, if we go from left to right, we have our CH3 group attached to the chlorine at the end. This is one environment. The CH3 groups above and below of that sort of quaternary carbon uh, are in the same environment, but they are um, a separate environment to that first one, so there's environment two. The CH2 group labelled A is a third environment, and then the CH2 group furthest to the right is a fourth environment.
Now, again, you might think that maybe the, the CH2 groups at the ends are equal, uh, that are, are in the same environment. Um, however, there's no mirror plane sort of down the middle of that molecule because we have a CH2 group on the right hand side and then that quaternary carbon and two CH3 groups on the left if we kind of went down the middle. And so it's actually not symmetric. And so overall, there are four, uh, four you'd see four peaks because there are four different hydrogen environments. Then we're getting the splitting of the pattern for the protons labelled A. Now A, um, if we have to look at the splitting, we need to look at the M plus 1 rule, so the number of hydrogens on the adjacent carbons. Going to the left is a quaternary carbon, there's no hydrogens on that, so we have to go to the right. There's two hydrogens on the adjacent carbon, M plus 1 and therefore equals 3, and therefore we would see a triplet. And then finally we were told to give the IUPAC name of J. So remember, for naming it for our UPAC, we have to find our longest carbon chain, have the lowest numbers, number any substituents and any functional groups in there, and we number things in alphabetical order, not numerical order. So our longest carbon chain here is four carbons long, literally starting from um, either the left or the right, it's four carbons long. And then we want our lowest numbers, and we achieve this if we go from left to right, because our chlorine groups would be on the one and the four carbons. So that's one, four, dichloro. Remember, if we have multiple of a certain substituent, we have to use the di, tri, tetra terminology. So one, four, dichloro. We then have our two methyl groups. Now, if we number from right to left, they're on carbon number three. If we number from left to right, they're on carbon number two. So we go that way. So that's two, two, dimethyl. And then because it's four carbons long, our main chain, based off a of butane length chain. Then to remember to, num uh, to, to name it alphabetically, so it is 1,4-dichloro, 2,2-dimethyl butane. Then going to the question that was over on the right, this was a, a telolol, a beta blocker. We had to give the name of each of the circled functional groups labeled J and K. J is an amide, that's a, a C double bond O connected to an NH group of some sort, that's an amide. And then labelled K, well that's just a, a nitrogen kind of on its own, connected to some carbon groups, that's an amine, and technically if we're being really proper about it, it's an amine connected to two carbon-based groups on either side, so it's a secondary amine. We were then uh, we're told that one of the peaks in the proton MR spectrum is produced by a CH2 group labelled P, uh, and using the table, which if you're not sure about the table, go back to one of the first slides where we had the table of chemical shifts, to suggest a ppm value, a chemical shift value for that peak and to name the splitting. So if we look at P in the structure, it's a CH2 group. So we can do the splitting first of all, look at adjacent carbons. To the left, it's an oxygen, so we don't need to worry. To the right, it's our CH group. So we have one hydrogen on that carbon, M plus one therefore equals two. And so we would see a one-to-one -one doublet. But essentially we have a, a hydrogens attached to a carbon that is attached to the, on the left directly to an oxygen on the right to a carbon that is itself bonded to an oxygen. So we can probably go for being in the same range as a kind of C attached to an oxygen, sort of an alcohol based kind of thing um, from that table. And so I'm going to put the range down here as, as 3.1 to 3.9 ppm. Now, again, just make sure you're careful with the question. Sometimes the question asks you to state a ppm value, in which case you just need to go somewhere within the range given on the table. Here the question asks you for a range of ppm values and therefore you have to give the range from the table. And then finally part C uh, was to suggest why CdCl3 and not CHCl3, so deuterated chloroform rather than normal chloroform was used as a solvent. The key thing is that CHCl3 contains a hydrogen atom, it would therefore interfere with the spectrum. What you would see is probably normally you use a lot more solvent to dissolve up your compound than it, it sort of, you need to make sure it's fully dissolved, so you use a lot of solvent. So your solvent peaks would massively outweigh the compound peaks. And also you can get some coupling between the solvent and the actual compounds. So again, you split your peaks into even more complicated patterns. And then finally, um, suggest why CdCl3 is a more effective solvent than CCl4 for polar molecules. The reason is that CdCl3 is an overall polar molecule. It has a dipole uh, with this carbon to chlorine bonds. They are their polar bonds because the chlorine is more electronegative. It's a tetrahedral shaped molecule. The key thing is that one of those bonds is a CD bond, three of them are CCL bonds, and so overall our dipoles going in different directions don't cancel each other out, so we have an overall polar molecule. For CCL4, again a tetrahedral molecule, but now we have um, 
these dipoles, the CCL dipoles, going in the directions they go in for a tetrahedral molecule, they cancel each other out. And so overall, it's a non-polar molecule. And we know that like dissolves like. So polar solvents tend to dissolve polar compounds. Non-polar compounds dissolve well in non-polar solvents. So a telolol being a polar molecule dissolves best in polar solvents. So thank you for watching this video. You can find many more videos like this on my YouTube channel. If you found the video helpful, please leave a review on the tuition website. I also offer online tuition for chemistry, so please check out my uh, tuition pages for prices and how to contact me. And if you need any more help with your chemistry, then you can feel free to always drop me an email. I'll be happy to help.